Hello and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Osman. In this week's episode, soft sand brings big headaches to our county beaches. The property appraiser makes big changes to its website and the library wants you to get smart about your money. Later on in the program, Joanne Magley talks with Jennifer Winters from Volusia County's Environmental Management. Those segments and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. I hope you stay tuned. Thinking of using one of the vehicle access ramps in Ormond Beach? Motorists should be aware of the soft sand on the beach, which is making it difficult to drive in the area. In fact, several vehicle beach access ramps in Ormond Beach are only accessible by four-wheel drive due to the soft sand. Well, this red sand's a little different. It, it's usually in the predominantly the, the northern parts of our driving area, usually up in the Ormond area. And it's different because the consistency is different. Even though it's dry or wet, the mud, the, mud, the red mud is, is real soft and there's no bottom to it. It doesn't stick together. So it's a little challenging for driving up here and it's a challenge to us because a lot of cars get stuck. There are several vehicle beach access ramps in Ormond Beach and historically, Granada Boulevard, Cardinal Avenue, Millsap Road and Harvard Drive have been four wheel drive only due to the soft sand. With the opening of four new ramps in February, the total number of vehicular access ramps in Ormond Beach has doubled. However, the new ramps, Seminole Avenue, Rockefeller Drive, River Beach Drive, and Boylston Avenue are also limited to four-wheel drive access due to their location and the condition of the sand. If you don't have a four-wheel drive vehicle, then don't try it because you're just gonna get buried and it's gonna put a strain on your vehicle, it's gonna put a strain on our vehicle. We're trying to open as much as we can to everybody, but there are some four wheel drive only areas that we want people to uh, respect and not go into. Beachgoers are encouraged to follow Volusia County Beaches on Facebook and Twitter at Volusia Beach for the latest beach and access ramp information. For a map of the vehicle access ramps, you can visit volusia.org slash beach driving. Volusia County's property appraisers website has recently been upgraded. Now the site allows users to search for more information with enhanced field options, view parcels via pictometry, and download information directly from the website. As I've described the system now, it's, it's like going from a black and white TV to a color TV. It's a, uh, it's a great way to uh, help people get the information they want to get in an easier to use way. The improvements include uh, a, a link now with the Clerk of Courts uh, website. So if you see something that uh, you, you would want to get a copy of from you know, the public records, you can go right over to the Clerk's website. So I think that's pretty big. I think our, our mapping system, we used to have three different maps and you'd have to go back and forth, and now we just have one mapping system, which I think is an improvement. It's been a, a long and, and, and sometimes grueling process of converting to this new system, but we're very happy with it, and I think the, um, the folks that come to our system will eventually be happy with it, because it really is new and, and better. With the new upgrades, now there are several data sets to search by, including neighborhood code, millage group, township, block, and lot. You can also now search using a combination of criteria. Another enhancement is pictometry, which allows users to look at the property from above and from all sides. Other improvements include links to the clerk's office, the county's revenue division, and connect live permits for parcel information without having to access those websites separately and re-enter the parcel information. Ability to download the information to Excel identify sales for the previous 18 months in a neighborhood, apply for a change of address online, and in a couple of months there will also be an option to apply online for homestead exemption. To check out the new site, you can visit vcpa.vcgov.org. 
Many of Volusia County's residents and visitors recognize the area's long tradition of fast cars and left turns. However, not everyone's familiar with its history of rum production. Kate Sark has the details in this week's Business Beat. The Three Chimneys Sugar Works site off Granada Boulevard is the oldest successful British sugar plantation, sugar mill, and rum distillery in the United States. While the site hasn't been used to distill rum since 1785, it has been restored and is included on the National Register of Historic Places. Bill the Real McCoy also gave the area a history with rum, settling in Holly Hill and making a name for himself rum running during early Prohibition. Recently, a local family recognized the past history of distilling in the area and decided to resurrect the art. Jeremy Craig's family has a history in beer. Both his grandfathers and his father worked at Schlitz in Tampa, and he always imagined he'd end up following in their footsteps. However, the growing popularity of craft breweries has created a more competitive market. When the family visited a craft distillery on a vacation several years ago, they knew they had stumbled upon something more unique. From there, the idea for Copper Bottom Craft Distillery was born. Hi, hey. nice to meet you, Jeremy Craig from Copper Bottom Craft Distillery. Wonderful. You ready for a tour? Yeah, let's go. Come on in. All right, so this is our distillery. This is where we make our, our rum and vodka. This right here is our mash cooker. This is where we cook everything up. Behind me on this side is our fermenters. We have three 300 gallon fermenters. And this is really where all the magic happens. This is the difference between us and the breweries. This is our still. We have a 300 gallon batch still with two offset columns um, that we can really make anything on. Uh, we can make anything from moonshine to vodka, bourbon, scotch, and obviously rum. So what does it take to start a distillery? My dad has a lot of experience setting up facilities and setting up facilities like this. Um, so that was a, a great skill set to have right there. I have a science background personally. Um, biology is my degree. Uh, I have a lot of chemistry in my background. So I knew the, the basics behind distillation and fermentation. Um, I also went up to Kentucky and took some classes up there um, to kind of learn the art behind it because the science is, the science is pretty basic. You can, you can work your way around uh, the science and math part of it. But the art is really where you learn how to, to, where to make those cuts and how to get those different flavor profiles that you're looking for. When it came to deciding what to distill, Craig says availability of materials is one of the most important factors. With sugar cane readily available in Florida, rum was a natural choice. They also produce vodka and have had several new types of rum in the works, including barrel-aged rum, spiced rum, and coconut rum. Craig says the name of the company was also a natural choice. The name is, it's an old, uh, mid-1700s uh, British Royal Navy term. Uh, back in the 1750s, the British Royal Navy started cladding the bottom of their ships with copper. And it made them barnacle resistant, it made them quicker. Um, so after a number of years, the sailors started calling each other copper bottoms if they were reliable and trustworthy, genuine, certain not to fail. Um, so we really like the double meaning. We like, since we're focusing on rum, um, we like the nautical part of it, but we also liked the, the double meaning where it's reliable and genuine and, and certain not to fail. The distillery is striving to live up to their name, taking efforts to set themselves apart from the competition. One of the things that makes Copper Bottom Craft Distillery so unique is that they do everything from cane to glass in-house. The entire process, from cooking the mash to distillation to bottling, takes about a week. Copper Bottom currently distills one batch at a time, producing about 40 cases, or 480 bottles, each week. After bottling, the batch number is handwritten on each bottle. Craig explains that, just like wine, each batch of liquor can be affected by many different variables, and there are slight differences from batch to batch. However, he says, that shouldn't discourage customers from opening their bottles. We really encourage people to drink it because, you know, it's, it's our art. You know, it's just like a, a painting. You want it to be enjoyed. You don't want it to be locked away in a closet. You want it to be enjoyed by people. And it's our art. We want it to be enjoyed. So take those bottles and open them up. <laughs> 
come back, there's always more. To meet Craig and learn more about this family-run business, plan a visit to Copper Bottom Craft Distillery in Holly Hill for a free tour and tasting. In addition to tours and tastings, the distillery is also available for private events. Vodka and rum can be purchased at the distillery, as well as at area ABC Fine Wine and Spirits and Total Wine and More. Copper Bottom products are also carried in many of the local independent bars and restaurants. For The Business Beat, I'm Kate Sark. Cheers. The Atlantic hurricane season begins June 1st and continues through November 30th. Be prepared and take time to develop your emergency plans. Stock a 14-day supply of non-perishable food, water, and medical items for your family. Identify special needs for you and your loved ones. Discuss and create an evacuation plan. Remember, shelter should only be used as a last resort. For more information, visit volusia.org slash emergency. You work hard for your money. Why not make your money work hard for you? Learn how to stretch your dollars during Money Smart Week, April 21st through the 28th at the Volusia County Public Library System. The county's library branches will host more than 70 Money Smart programs, ranging from story times for children to estate planning for adults. Money Smart Week was an initiative started by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and the American Library Association um, just to promote uh, financial um, programs in the libraries uh, to uh, the public. Just all kinds of different programs and in the spirit of, uh, of Money Smart Week. Financial advisors will share information about investments and identity theft, and a professional couponer will offer tips on maximizing your savings with coupons. Money Smart Week is a national public awareness campaign designed to help consumers better manage their personal finances. For a complete list of local library programs, you can visit volusia.org slash money smart. Turtle fans and families can expect a shell of a good time at the Marine Science Center's annual celebration. Gary Daniels gives us an inside look at what visitors can expect at Turtle Day 2018 on April 28th. event of the year for the Marine Science Center. It's a day that we're free to the public. It's a chance for us to showcase the work that we do with the uh, uh, rehabilitation and hopefully release of sea turtles. But it's also a chance for people to see the other things that we have going on. We have a variety of exhibits and aquariums, a stingray touch pool. We also have another hospital. We have a separate uh, bird hospital where we care for thousands of uh, uh, injured and sick uh, birds. Also environmental organizations throughout the region to also come and celebrate with us. So uh, it's a, a great day for the public to come out, at a great family event with food and music, a chance to really celebrate the work that's done here at the Marine Science Center. entire Turtle Day event is also punctuated with educational programming so that we have opportunities for people to uh, have reptile programs, to have programs about uh, our birds of prey. We have uh, six birds of prey at the Marine Science Center that are glove trained raptors so it allows the public to be up close and personal with these uh, wonderful uh, birds of prey. Whenever we host an event like this, we hope that people gain a greater appreciation for the marine environments that surround us right here in Volusia County. You know, we do have this incredible position of being uh, right at, uh, here at the Marine Science Center, right at one of the most phenomenal uh, uh, inlets uh, on Florida's east coast. And the inlet, the marine environments that surround the inlet, and of course the ocean itself provide this really fabulous mosaic of marine environments. Environments. And the end result is we want people to love these areas, to appreciate them, and hopefully be better stewards of this beautiful place that we call Volusia County.
they said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Let's join Community Information Director Joanne Magley in the studio with her guest, Jennifer Winters, the Sea Turtle Program Manager for Volusia County. Thanks, Amber. Well, turtle season in Volusia County begins May 1st, and this five-month observation of turtle nesting habits is closely watched by Volusia County, and in particular, key staff of the Environmental Management Division. So joining us today to talk about turtle nesting season is Jennifer Winters. She's Volusia County's Habitat Conservation Plan Manager. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, good morning. Thanks for being here. So for those folks who are either new to the area, or maybe they're visiting, or just they need a refresher, Talk about turtle nesting season and why it's in place. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, sea turtle nesting season officially begins May 1st, and every summer we have uh, sea turtles visiting our beaches, usually at night, to lay their eggs on our nice dry sand. Um, so they'll emerge out of the water and they'll come up and they'll crawl into you know dark, quiet areas and they'll lay about 100 eggs in each nest. And so last year, I know we had a really good year for turtle nests. We did. We had an above average year with over 700 sea turtle nests countywide. Um, our average number is about 500, so it was a really big year for us. We were excited. And what sort of sea turtles come onto our beaches to lay their eggs? We have three main species of turtles. The loggerheads are the most common and they nest in the hundreds. Last year we had over 600 loggerhead nests. Um, our next most common species is the green sea turtle, which nests in the tens. And last year we set a new record high and had 84 green sea turtle nests. Wow. So it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but for us it was. <laughs> and then our third most common is our leatherback sea turtles. And the most we've ever had in one season is only 13 leatherback sea turtle nests. Um, and unfortunately last year we did didn't have any. <laughs> mm. um, however, we're, we're hopeful that this year they'll come back. Um, and we had another rare visitor last year was the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And worldwide, they're the world's smallest and rarest mm. sea turtles. They primarily nest next in Mexico. However, we had four Kemp's Ridley sea turtle nests last year. And so that's a lot of nests. You said, I think, over 700 nests, and that's yes. a lot. How yes. do you tally those nests and keep track of all that activity? It's a lot of work. Um, we have a small army of volunteers mainly that go out every morning and they're marking every single sea turtle crawl that they see on the beach. And actually we have probably about twice as many um, crawls as we do nests. And so oftentimes turtles will emerge from the ocean and choose not to lay eggs. Mm. Um, but we look at every single crawl track in the sand first thing in the morning and we fill out a data field sheet on those and we mark off the sea turtle nest. And all that information gets sent to my office where we we have a database and we keep track of things and we um, we put dates on each nest so that we know when they're due to hatch and we monitor them all the way through their incubation period. And then we even go so far as to evaluate how successful the nest was. So we've got a lot of information on, on all of our nests. What other activity do you track besides the laying of <coughs> the eggs? Um, we look for when each nest emerges, and so sometimes one nest will emerge multiple nights, and we also will document any problems that may be around a nest. If there's obstacles in front of the nest, we, we remove the obstacles in the evenings. Um, we also record any problems with nearby lighting, which may affect the hatchlings when they come out of the nest. If there's bright lights in the area, they may be misled away from the ocean. Um, we do inspections for the, the light and then if an event happens where the turtles did go away from the ocean, we go out and do inspections on those. Because, uh, talk <laughs> about the, the lighting a little more. Turtles naturally are attracted to 
the the natural uh, reflection of the moonlight and the stars yes. on onto Over the ocean. The water. Yes. Um, so when there's these artificial lights, which you know I guess is common in a tourist beach area right. where people live and where people you know stay and vacation, yes. that's an issue because it then attracts the turtles somewhere else. So right. talk about the lighting ordinance that we have that's part of our habitat conservation plan. Okay. And then you can get it more into the habitat in, uh, information plan as well. Okay. Um, well, the lighting ordinance is in place and, and it was really designed to help minimize the impacts um, from lights on the beach. And so there's three main parts of the ordinance and we require that no source of light be visible from the beach, that no light should illuminate the sand, and then finally that no reflective surface of the fixtures should be visible because oftentimes a metal shield on a light mm -hmm. can reflect and appear to be as bright as the source of light. Um, so those are the three main things that we try to guide people to avoid um, to help reduce the light that's coming out on the beach. Um, but certainly in an urban area, you've got a lot of lighting. It may not be directly visible from the beach, but it still can contribute to problems because the, the glow overall is um, outshines the natural horizon over the water. Um, so in those instances, you know, we really just go out and we work with people and try to educate them. Uh, mainly, one of the things that's, that's really interesting that scientists have um, discovered is that long wavelengths of light, which appear amber and red to the human eye, um, are actually less visible to sea turtles and mm -hmm. they're less attractive. Mm -hmm. And so if we can use long wavelength, like usually like an amber LED type of light um, directly adjacent to the beach, that really helps reduce the problems with the turtles going in the wrong way. And there's also things mm -hmm. like certain types of shields and just the way that people have their shades and their blinds in their windows. Yes, just simple things like that. If they you know, can remember to uh, close the blinds at night, um, turn off lights if they're not being used, those sorts of things can really go a long way to help protect our sea turtle nest. All right, so go talk a little bit more about the Habitat Conservation Plan because uh, this plan has been in place for, for a while and mm -hmm. it really dictates what can be done on the beach right. so to ensure that our habitat of, of animals and such is healthy and, and thrives. Right. Um, the the HCP has actually been in place for 20 years now <laughs> and so when it was developed <clears throat> the concern primarily was about the amount of human use particularly with vehicles driving on our beaches and the impacts that that could have to the sea turtle nesting habitat. So w what they did was they looked at the whole entire county, all of our beaches, and all of the sea turtle data to determine where are turtles using our beaches more, um, and how can we protect and, and help manage the vehicles to reduce the impacts to the turtles nesting. Um, so they came up with a few different ways and parts of the plan was to separate um, the county into different beach management areas. And so one of the, the main things that, that we did was um, establish natural beach management areas. And those are the areas that are off limits to public driving where we get the most of our sea turtle nests. Mm -hmm. And they happen to be you know, at the north and south end of the county, which is less developed, darker, adjacent to other parks. Um, and for the 20 years, we've still been seeing those turtles come back into those areas primarily. Um, in our public driving areas, we have what we call the conservation zone. And that's the line of four by four, four posts in the sand that protects the upper beach from people parking and driving in that area. Um, and the reason being is because turtles will instinctually go higher on the beach mm -hmm. into a dry sand area. Their eggs are gonna have a better chance of development um, higher up on the beach. So by separating vehicles from parking and driving in there, we protect the habitat from any sort of you know, impacts with a, maybe a potentially a car running over a nest, but also it allows the sand to build and the vegetation to grow. And so those are some of the big parts of the plan. And so what, uh what happens when turtles nest in the more popular or populated areas of the beach? How do we uh, extra protect, I guess, right, those right. areas? Because if cars are coming and going and 
and yes. little baby sea turtles <clears throat> are going to emerge. How, how do we deal with that? Okay, well, first of all, we mark every single nest in the county. Um, and on average, we only've got about 25 nests that intermingle with all of the millions of vehicles that come to drive mm -hmm. on our beaches. Every year, you know, that the way the management plan is set up, it, it really works in separating those things. However, those nests that are intermingling, we, um, we put up extra stakes and just uh, more ribbon and, and cones to make it very visible to drivers. Mm -hmm. And we've actually never had a, a marked nest impacted mm -hmm. by a vehicle at all. So that, that's working. Do those get extra monitoring <laughs> by, by the folks who volunteer to watch and, and um, monitor the nests? Uh, not necessarily. All of the nests are checked every day. Um, they may be a little easier to, to get to and more people are, are having foot traffic around the nests, um, but for the most part people are, are really good <clears throat> about you know staying out of the marked area and, and that sort of thing. So the, the nests are marked every day. What happens when uh, you, there's a nest that should have, uh, all the eggs should have hatched? And time goes by, and, and they you don't, don't, you don't yeah. see any progress. Right. Uh, we, or mainly the volunteers, follow state guidelines for when they can go in and determine and evaluate a nest. Um, and typically, they have to wait at least 70 days. And that's all. That's all managed by the state of Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and so um, they usually are involved with with that if it has to go for an extended period. We did have one nest that was laid very late last season, I, I believe in October, that incubated for months longer. <laughs> but it was sort of an experiment to see if the eggs would develop because as the cooler temperatures um, come, it, it takes longer to to develop the eggs. Did they develop? No, no, unfortunately uh, they didn't. But we gave that nest every chance uh, possible. <laughs> yeah, so, so and, and you know, it's, it's still incredible to think that even with the hurricane that we experienced, that we still had such a good year for, for yes, eggs on our beach. we did, we did. Um, even after Hurricane Irma, we had turtles come back in and lay new nests after the storm. So that was, you know, that was encouraging. So with, with the season starting soon, what are some other things people can do to just ensure that the turtle nesting season is a successful and healthy season? Um, really just be, you know, a responsible beach user. If you're going to the beach for the day, make sure you pack out whatever you pack in mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, pick up extra if you can. Because sometimes other people aren't as responsible and there may be things out there that are left behind that could be obstacles for sea turtles. Um, trash in particular can attract predators. Because those baby sea turtles, yes. it's, you know, <laughs> It's a challenge to come up from the nest, crawl, you know, all the way through the sand, oh, yes. make your way to the ocean. Right. You know, you don't need a big cup in your way trying to exactly. crawl through. Exactly. Yes, and even, you know, even the vehicle tracks. We have a program in place where we go out and we smooth the sand out in front of each nest that's due to hatch in those public driving areas to give them the best chance possible. So, um, anything people can do, if you are if you are an oceanfront property owner, go down to the beach at night, take a look at your property and see if there's any lights that you may have forgotten about or don't know about, um, especially since the hurricane, there was so much damage and remodeling and rebuilding mm -hmm. that sometimes the lighting is not on the forefront of people's mind. Right. Um, so we're, we're here to work with people and help educate them and get the properties back up to par. And if anybody needs assistance, they can call your office and uh, of if folks are interested in volunteering, how can they find out more about either volunteering or just really anything turtle season related? Um, our website is the best place to go. It's www.voluciaseaturtles.org. All right. Well, Jennifer Winters, the Volusia County Habitat Conservation Plan Manager, thank you so much for being thank our guest you. today. <laughs> Amber, back to you. Thanks, Joanne. And thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here. Or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Osmond. Have a wonderful evening.